Just under three years before the sinking of the RMS Titanic, another ship which will go down in history and become later known as Australia's Titanic would disappear without a trace. A ship which was also considered to be unsinkable. Hmm, we've heard that one before. She took all 211 crew and passengers with her, and none have ever been seen again. Not even a trace has ever been found. In fact, they disappeared so utterly that not even a single life belt or piece of debris was ever found. This story is simply and utterly baffling. Many searches have been commenced since she vanished. One individual named Emlyn Brown even spent 22 years searching for her wreck in the area she was last known to be in, but found nothing. The ship was utterly gone without a single trace. Today, I will tell you the story of the SS Waratah, a mystery that has gone unsolved for over a century. We will be covering the history of the ship, her last voyage and disappearance, and the theories of what might have happened to her. So, I hope you're intrigued. This is quite the mystery. If you enjoy documentary-type content along these lines, please like and subscribe so that I know you want to see more of it. And, if you enjoy ocean-related mysteries, check out my videos How a Ghost Ship Killed One-Third of Norway and The Scariest Ghost Ship Story in History. Two different videos that cover two different ghost ship stories, one of which I'm confident in saying you've probably not heard before. I've also made other documentaries as well about a variety of topics, from cryptids to prehistory, so please check out the playlist to see all the videos I've done. It's linked below. The next documentary after this one will also be related to the ocean, but we'll be covering one of the most frightening prehistoric predators to ever menace the seas. So stay tuned if you're interested. I've also narrated original stories that I've written, so stick around to the end to see some of the thumbnails, and if you're interested, please check them out. They will also be linked below. Okay, with all of that covered, let's start the story. We will begin with the history of the ship itself. Waratah was 465 feet long when constructed from 1907 to 1908. She was a blue anchor line ship and completed her sea trials in 1908. She also passed all inspections from her builders, owners, the Board of Trade, and Lloyds of London. The original order for the ship was placed in September 1907 with a construction period of 12 months. By W. Lund and Sons, Barclay Curl of Glasgow was hired for the project with it being a new cargo and passenger vessel for the aforementioned Blue Anchor Line. The Waratah was laid down at Barclay Curl's Clydeholm Yard and later launched in September 1908, a year after the original order had been placed, as hoped for. Waratah's sister ship was the SS Gee Long. In, in August 1909, Geelong would actually be among the ships searching the ocean for her vanished sister, Waratah. Sadly, Geelong wouldn't last forever either. She would be sunk in the Mediterranean on January 1st in 1916, just under seven years after the Waratah would vanish. I bring Geelong up for an additional reason. Because when Waratah was being designed, she was being designed to be an improved version of the already existing Geelong, which launched in 1904 so most of her specifications were based on Geelong. Waratah was able to move at a speed of 13.5 knots on average, while Geelong could average a speed of 12, though she could push herself to 14 if need be. Waratah had a crew of 154 on average, 423 passenger cabins, and along with an additional 600 spaces for temporary dormitories in the holds, and lifeboat and raft space for a total of 921 people. Remember, this was before the sinking of the Titanic, so the issue of there not being enough lifeboats wasn't really a mainstream issue at this point. Waratah cost £139,900 to build. Her captain was Joshua Edward Ilbury, who had been the captain of Waratah's sister ship. Waratah also had no wireless set, 
meaning if she did become distressed at sea, then she would be on her own and have no way to contact land. While Waratah was on her maiden voyage in 1908, it was reported by her second officer that there was a fire in the lowered starboard bunker that extended all the way to the engine room. It was brought under control by noon that day, but it continued to reignite for the next four days until December 10th. Uninsulated steam valves were found to be the cause of the fires, and repairs were done in Sydney under the supervision of the chief, and they were done to their satisfaction. From there, Waratah made a few more trips until arriving in London again in March of 1909 to finalize her maiden voyage. She unloaded her cargo and was put into dry dock for inspection and underwent a few minor repairs at this time. The captain and crew of Waratah criticized the ship for her stability and handling, the captain even bluntly saying the ship was not as stable as his previous vessel. These comments caused some heated words to be exchanged between the captain, the ship's owners, and the ship's builders. On April 29, 1909, only a few months before she would disappear, the Waratah set out on her second trip to Australia. She was carrying 193 steerage passengers on this trip, along with 22 cabin passengers, a crew of 119, and a large cargo. The trip was uneventful, and the steamer arrived on June 6, after roughly a three-week trip. At port, the steamer unloaded around 970 tons of lead ore, and then continued down to Melbourne. And on this leg of the trip, she had to plow her way through a strong gale, which complicated her berthing on her arrival on June 11. From there, the ship continued down to Sydney, once she arrived, she loaded her new cargo for the return trip. Once the cargo was loaded, which consisted of flour, wool, dairy, frozen meat, and 7,800 bars of bullion, she left port on June 26 and made a few more stops before arriving in Durban. This leg of the trip also had 100 passengers, as well as a convict who was being extradited to a Transvaal colony, along with an escort of true Transvaal policemen. Fun fact, while in Durban, one Claude G. Sawyer, an experienced sea traveler and engineer, had felt nervous about the behavior of the ship during his voyage, and had even experienced a premonition in dreams, which he saw as a warning to leave the ship. He sent a telegram to his wife in London, saying that the ship had arrived in Durban, and that he felt she was top-heavy and he left the vessel while it was in Durban. The ship would vanish after leaving port, and this decision saved Sawyer's life. Had he stayed on, the number of missing would instead be 212. At 8.15 p.m. on July 26, 1909, the Waratah left Durban. She had 211 passengers and crew on board. On July 27, at 4 a.m., she was spotted astern by the steamer Clan McLintry, and as Waratah was the faster ship, she gradually came level with the Clan McLintry, and by 6 a.m. the two ships communicated with each other via their signal lamps. If you don't know what those are, you know the scene in Titanic while the lifeboats are being lowered, and you see the lights on the bridge wings flashing? That's what those are, signal lamps. It would have been the same general setup on the Waratah. So, the two ships communicated, and they shared who they were and what their destinations were, general information that was customary to share. Waratah then overtook the Clan McLintray near the southeast coast of the colony of Natal, at the mouth of the Banshee River. The Clan McLintray would lose sight of Waratah when she passed over the horizon at 9.30 that morning. This was the last confirmed time the ship was ever seen. Other unconfirmed sightings did occur over the next few days, and we will cover them later in the video. For now though, let's carry on with the events that followed the last confirmed sighting. Later that day, the weather took a turn for the worst, with experienced captains calling it the worst they'd ever seen. With the captain of the Clan McLintry even saying it was the worst he'd seen in 13 years of sea experience. Strong winds and high seas are not uncommon in the region, and this swell had in fact developed into a hurricane by July 28. Since Waratah was considered unsinkable, man, we really gotta stop calling ships that, and since it wasn't uncommon at the time for ships to sometimes be weeks overdue, 
When the ship didn't arrive on schedule, no one batted an eye. The absolute worst case scenario people initially thought was that she'd had a medical... A uh, medical? I'm gonna leave that in. Maybe it'll make you laugh. The worst case scenario people thought initially was that she'd had a mechanical problem and broken down and was adrift. However, fears for her safety and the safety of her passengers and crew began to grow when other ships traveling the same route reported no signs of her on the entire length of their voyage. The 1st of August, 1909, saw the first search effort when the tugboat T.E. Fuller was sent out to try to locate the Waratah. This search was abandoned when the weather again turned poor. Royal Navy cruisers HMS Pandora and HMS Fort, along with, later, the HMS Hermes, were deployed to search for the Waratah, with Hermes specifically focusing on the last place the ship was confirmed to have been sighted. Hermes also encountered waves in the region where the Waratah was last sighted, so massive that she was heavily damaged and had to be put into dry dock for repairs. Numerous more ships joined the search. Remember earlier I mentioned that the Waratah's sister ship, Geelong, was among them. The German steamship Goslar even kept a special watch specifically for the Waratah for 1,262 miles of ocean. Still nothing. One ship, whose name I'm going to put on screen because I'm going to butcher this, the Insinzawa, reported spotting bodies near where the Waratah was last sighted, but they turned out to merely be dead stakes. Look at that. Stakes showed up in my Loch Ness Monster video, and here they are again, too. Someone make a conspiracy theory. Despite all the ships looking, and the utter lack of any sign of Waratah or any wreckage of Waratah's August continued, Hope remained that the ship was still afloat somewhere. Waratah had enough provisions on board to last everyone a year, so even if she drifted hundreds of miles off course, they would still be alive. Due to her lack of a wireless set, it would be impossible for the ship to communicate unless another vessel passed close enough for visual communication to be established. On December 15, 1909, with no sightings of Waratah for over four months, she was officially labeled as missing at Lloyd's of London. In early 1910, family members of passengers on the Waratah came together and charted their own rescue mission, hiring the ship Wakefield, which conducted a 15,000-mile or 24,000-kilometer search over a period of four months. Again, nothing was found. As the years began to pass, occasional scattered reports of wreckage being found would pop up. Rumors of a life preserver marked Waratah washing up on New Zealand cropped up in 1912. In 1925, Lieutenant D.J. Roos of the South African Air Force said he'd spotted a wreck which matched the Waratah while flying over a coastline. Timbers, possibly from Waratah, also washed ashore in East London in 1939. However, keep in mind that with previous instances of ships vanishing without a trace, it's not been uncommon for false artifacts to wash up months or years later. Check out the story of the SS city of Boston for an example of this kind of hoax. Back then, all the rage seemed to be with making fake messages and bottles from ships which vanished and then letting people find them washed up on a beach. As far as I know, the only time something like this has been considered legitimate was in the case of the SS Pacific. Point is, none of these stories of items from the Waratah have been confirmed, and they should not be treated as any kind of proof of the ship's fate unless proven otherwise. Modern searches have had no better luck when it comes to finding any trace of the Waratah. I mentioned Emlyn Brown at the start of the video. He spent 22 years searching for the Waratah from the early 1980s to 2004. In 1999, he thought he'd found the ship while working alongside the National Underwater and Marine Agency and author Clive Custler. And newspapers reported that the wreck was found off the eastern coast of South Africa, resting on the seafloor 10 kilometers out to sea. A sonar scan showed a wrecked ship which seemed to match the lost SS Warta. A dive to the site in 2001, however, revealed that the wreck had been wrongly identified as Warta, and the wreck was actually that of the SS Nelsie Meadow, a ship sunk during World War II 
On May 8, 1943, the SS Nelsie Meadow had left Cape Town for Bombay. During this trip on May 11th, she was torpedoed by German submarine U-196. And after finding a picture of the Nelsie Meadow, yeah, I can see why it would be misidentified as Warsaw. They look similar to each other. They have a very similar shape. In 2004, Emlyn Brown declared that after 22 years of searching, he was giving up. He said, quote, I've exhausted all the options. I have no idea where to look. As I mentioned earlier, unconfirmed sightings from July, in the days after the last confirmed sighting of Warta, came up too. If any of these are valid remains unknown, but here is each known one. I'll let you make up your own mind. Just like with the Orang Madan and Loch Ness Monster videos, I'm going to tell you the evidence and then let you decide if you think any of them hold some truth or not. First comes from the ship Harlow on July 27, 1909. Remember that Waratah left Durban on July 26. The last confirmed sighting of her was in the morning of July 27, and she was expected to reach Cape Town on July 29. This possible sighting by the Harlow occurred in the evening of July 27 at 5.30 p.m., 17.30 hours. They saw the smoke of a steamer on the horizon, and the smoke was so thick that the captain of the Harlow wondered if this mysterious steamer was on fire. After darkness fell, they saw the steamer's running lights approaching them, still 10 to 12 miles back. Suddenly, they saw two bright flashes, but heard no sound due to the distance, and the lights vanished. The Harlow captain thought the steamer exploded, but his mate convinced him that it was brush fires on the shore, a common thing that occurs. The captain agreed and opted not to record the incident in the log, and only thought back on the incident as being significant after he learned that the Waratah had vanished. According to the captain of the Harlow, the ship was around 180 miles or 290 kilometers from Durban when the incident occurred. Keep this story in mind as it will come back up later in the video. Exactly four hours later on that same evening, a Union Castle liner, whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce, here it is on screen, which was traveling north from the Cape of Good Hope, passed a ship, and they exchanged signals by the signal lamps, though due to the rough seas and bad weather, they could only make out the last three letters of the passing ship's name. Those letters apparently were T. A H. In my opinion, out of the unconfirmed sightings, I think this one probably is the only one that was an actual sighting of the Waratah. It can't be confirmed, but that's my opinion. I think that this was probably the last actual sighting of the ship. Another sighting was not reported until 1929, and I don't really know if I believe this one. Eyewitness testimony is, of course, the least reliable form of evidence, so... Again, I'll just let you make up your own mind. The story was reported by Edward Joe Conker. He was a Cape Mounted Rifleman. According to him, on July 28, 1909, he observed through a telescope while conducting a military exercise at the mouth of the Ixora River a steamship which looked like the Waratah struggling slowly through the rough seas, heading southwest. He watched as the ship rolled heavily in the rough seas before while already being pulled partially over, a powerful wave struck her, swamped her, and caused her to fully roll over and then quickly vanish from view. According to Conker, his orderly sergeant did not take the matter seriously, and as a result, he never came forward with his story until 1929. The story is definitely possible, and it is in line with one of the theories about what caused the war to vanish, but remember, Eyewitness testimony is the least reliable form of evidence, so I'll leave you with the story and let you make up your own mind on whether or not you believe Conker or not. With the last confirmed sighting, when the weather changed, and all of these unconfirmed stories in mind, I'd say that whatever happened to the Waratah probably occurred on July 28. Before we cover the theories about why Waratah disappeared, it's worth mentioning what happened because she disappeared. Blue Anchor Line's ticket sales for their liners dropped severely, and the criticism directed towards the company did not help either. 
and the loss of sales and the huge financial loss of Warsaw all combined and in the end it forced the company to sell many of its ships and then voluntar voluntarily liquidate itself beginning in 1910. In this section, we are going to cover each of the main theories about the fate of the Waratah. After we go through each one, tell me which one you think is the fate that befell the ship, or if you have your own theory based on your own research. I'd love to know. First up is the most widely accepted theory today, the idea that the ship was struck by a rogue wave. As I said, I'm pretty sure that this is the most widely accepted explanation for the disappearance of the Waratah. Rogue waves, also known as freak waves, are common in that area of the ocean south of Africa. The theory goes that during the storm, while already dealing with stability issues, the Waratah was struck by a massive wave, and these can sneak up on you and just come out of nowhere, which is what makes them so scary. This wave would have either rolled the ship all the way over, or flooded her hold and pulled the ship underwater and sank it within seconds after being swamped. If the ship capsized quickly, it's likely any buoyant debris would have been trapped below her and sank with her, hence why there's no wreckage anywhere to be found, either washed up on a beach or drifting out in the ocean. Such waves have also broken ships apart and caused them to sink in minutes as well. Now, as an expansion of the rogue wave idea, we have my personal favorite theory about the fate of the Waratah, the stranded in Antarctica theory. This theory goes that the ship was struck by a rogue wave, but it didn't sink. Instead, her rudder was damaged and the ship began to drift. Taken by the current, she was then pulled south and either sank somewhere way south of Africa or ran aground in or sank off, off the coast of Antarctica. There is no evidence for this at all, save the fact that no wreck of the ship has been found anywhere in the region that she would have expected to be in had she sunk. And remember, the ship had no wireless set, so if she did become disabled and drifted south, then she'd have no way to call for help. So, something to keep in mind. Also, a fun fact that relates about this idea, in 1913, the Daily Mail thought their competitor, the Daily Standard, was copying them, so they printed a false story about the Waratah being found in Antarctica, and the Daily Standard fell right into it, and they printed the same story. Anyway, the theory basically says that she ran aground somewhere or sank in Antarctica after drifting there following a strike from a wave, and simply hasn't been found. Moving on, here are some other ideas that are being tossed around. The next most popular theory seems to be the idea of a cargo shift. During the voyage, which she disappeared on, Waratah was carrying a cargo of 1,000 tons of lead, as well as an additional 300 tons of lead ore concentrate. The thing about that is, is lead ore concentrate is known to, in certain conditions, liquefy due to the motion of a ship. Yeah, that'll throw off your balance. And as we've established, Waratah left something to be desired when it came to her stability in good conditions. Basically, if lead ore concentrate liquefies, it can throw a ship off balance and cause it to capsize. Today, we understand that lead ore concentrate is a, ca is a hazardous cargo, and when ships transport it, safety precautions are put in place to protect the ship and the crew. Not back then. They didn't know this. There was basically no awareness to this issue back then. So this is certainly possible. In bad weather, with an already unstable ship, I could definitely see this causing Wartaw to capsize. So, like the rogue wave idea, this one is definitely very possible. Another theory is that the Wartaw was caught in a massive whirlpool. Now we're getting into theories here that aren't as widely accepted, so keep that in mind. These aren't quite as sound as the first ones. This one has been tossed around since the ship originally disappeared and continues to get brought up today, and it says that the Waratah was caught in a whirlpool created by a combination of winds and the weather at the time as a whole, currents, and a deep ocean trench. And there are a lot of those in that area. They are kind of common in that whole region off of southeastern 
Africa's coastline. While this theory does explain the lack of wreckage, no evidence today supports the idea that a whirlpool could be created which is strong enough to suck down such a big ship. Remember, she was 450 feet long with a beam of 59 feet 4 inches. And it's thought to be highly unlikely, if not impossible, for a whirlpool to form that could suck a, su a ship that big down basically instantly. Another theory is that the ship exploded. This theory comes from one of the possible sightings I covered earlier, specifically the Harlow sighting. Remember, the running lights on the unidentified steamer vanished after those two bright flashes of light. The theory goes that the Waratah was obliterated in a sudden explosion within one of her coal bunkers. However, no explosion like this would make a ship as big as the Waratah sink instantly, especially without leaving any wreckage. So this theory seems the most unlikely to me. In all honesty, I'd rank these theories as most likely to least likely in the order that we just went through them. Tell me what you think, though. So, which theory do I buy? I love the Antarctica one, but I think the rogue wave makes the most sense. I feel like the ship had to sink quickly and intact for no debris to be found. It's somewhere, but the fact that it vanished just so utterly is unnerving. You know, it's just gone, and so is everyone on board her. You know, I get it. Um, this happened over a century ago, and it's hard to sometimes personally relate to stuff that happened so long ago you know, that we are so removed from today. But those were people. Human beings, and they just vanished utterly. What happened to them? You know, for a lot of people today, their great-grandparents or grandparents were alive when this ship vanished. A century really isn't that long ago. And I think it's important to remember that. And you know, this ship has kind of fallen into obscurity, maybe in part to the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, but Titanic was almost in this exact same situation. The Marconi wireless set on Titanic broke during the voyage, and Phillips and Bride disregarded protocol and fixed the set. If they hadn't, no one would have heard Titanic's SOS, and today we probably would not know what happened to the Titanic either. Titanic would probably be just as mysterious of a mystery as Waratah if that had been what happened. Now what do I think? Again, I think the most likely thing is the rogue wave theory. The fact that the ship was unsteady in calm weather supports this. Rough weather, uh, rough water, and a giant wave just sound like a disaster waiting to happen. And the ocean is big. It could have happened anywhere, and it's so much space to look through that it's probably impossible to find the ship unless you search every inch of its route and then some outside of that, because in all likelihood the ship was likely off course a little bit after being rocked and moved around by the stormy ocean. Though again, I do love the idea of the ship drifting down and running aground in Antarctica. I think that could make a very cool speculative history movie. You know, the ship being hit by a wave but not fully capsizing and then drifting south while everyone tries to survive. Imagine finding it there one day, just run aground and coated in ice on some frozen beach in Antarctica. You know, I love that theory, but I don't think it's the one I buy. The story of the Waratah is something that I only recently discovered, but it captivated me. I'm so enamored with this story, and I hope one day that we find the wreck I'm beginning to sound like a broken record because in my paleo documentaries I've talked about how much I hope we find more fossils of some of the animals I've talked about like Gracepithecus and Auroran. I also want to take a moment and mention some other ships which vanished but don't always get much attention and give them some love and recognition. SS Cambana, the SS Pacific, the SS City of Boston, the SS City of Glasgow, the SS Ismailia, the SS Tempest, the Burma, the Neustria, the SS Naronic, 
the SS Canisota, which, wow, looks a lot like the Waratah. And there's literally a list on Wikipedia of hundreds more from around the world. Along with incredibly long lists of people who disappeared at sea, ghost ships, and ships that sank. And some of those lists go back thousands of years. I encourage you to look up the uh, look, look up these stories and these ships and the people who were on them and give their stories, you know, a read through. You know, they don't deserve to be forgotten. You know, the famous ones like Titanic, Lusitania, Britannic, Carpathia, they tend to drown some of these others out. And just like the Waratah, human beings were on those ships. The famous stories to the obscure ones. They don't deserve to not be remembered. And just because you weren't on a famous ship like Titanic, it doesn't mean your story and your ship should never get any of the attention. I love the story of the Titanic as much as the next person. It will always be my favorite shipwreck story. A Night to Remember is and always will be one of my favorite movies. And Cameron's Titanic from 1997 has left an impact on my life because it introduced me to and made me become in love with the Titanic and her story, and I think it also is what got me fascinated with shipwrecks in the first place. But these other stories and mysteries don't deserve, you know, to not be remembered. They deserve to get attention and be told too. You know, like the SS Atlantic, which sank in 1873. It was White Star Line's most infamous ship disaster before the sinking of the Titanic in 1912, but you never hear it get brought up anymore. One day I will make a video about the SS Atlantic and tell her story. Just please look up some of these stories and read about them. Don't let them be forgotten. The internet has given us access to so much knowledge. You know, we live in such a privileged time, honestly. So please, just take some time and look up some of these ships and their stories and the people who were on them. And also remember, Waratah's less known sister ship also sank. She had a collision and sank in the Mediterranean. Waratah and her sister, gone. Just like that. Geelong couldn't find her little sister, and then she too was lost to the ocean. Albeit in a much less mysterious way, but in the end, the ocean took them both. And it's not the ocean, you know, the Great Lakes do it too. And I have a book called Went Missing, which is full of stories about ships which disappeared in the exact same way on the Great Lakes, and someday maybe I'll tell some of the stories from that book in a video. So with all that said, I'm going to wrap this up. That was the story of the disappearance of the Waratah and the names of some of the lesser known ships who all have their own stories and who also vanished and in most cases without any trace ever being found. Out of all those ships which vanished, SS Pacific was the only one who left something behind that the ocean spat back out. You know, but each of those ships vanished just the same and as just mysteriously. The ocean swallowed them all up the same the ocean is a place of stories and some of the greatest mysteries of all time. And you know, the story of the Waratah is just one of those mysteries. The tip of a very large iceberg. Waratah is not even a drop in the bucket of stories. I'll let you ponder, and I'll sign off for now. I love mysteries, and I love ships. And when those two things come together, I'm hooked. Line, sinker, and all. Tell me, what you think happened to the Waratah? Do you think she's a wreck on the bottom of the ocean off southern Africa in a place no one has looked? Maybe nestled at the bottom of some deep trench? Or do you think she exploded? Or do you think she drifted south and now rests somewhere on the coastline in Antarctica? I think I like that theory because it's not only a grand idea of a final voyage you can write a fictional story around, but also because if she did drift down there, she might be in decent shape, and if she's ever found, we might get answers. You know, I just like this idea because if she did drift down into Antarctica, uh, down to the coast, and ran aground somewhere down there instead of sinking, she'd still be there on that beach. And there's just that appealing feeling when it comes to, uh, to the idea of 
one of these grand old steamships still being out there and existing today, preserved, when almost all of them have long since been scrapped and, for the most part, only now exist in paintings of a long bygone age. It's a cool idea. However, as much as I like it, I think she was probably swamped by a wave and no one has just looked in quite the right spot to find the wreck. Tell me your theory, though. I'd love to know. So thank you for watching. I hope you found the mystery interesting. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. And I hope you took something away from this fascinating story. The story of the Waratah is so captivating, and it really just makes you wonder what happened. Your imagination can picture any story of a, rap of a rapid sinking with people trapped inside the ship, or a desperate fight for survival as they drift further and further south towards Antarctica. And I hope you see why now. Again, thank you for watching. Check my other documentaries out. And until the next one, that's all for now. Have a good one, everyone.